Yeah. Hey, welcome to another episode of Coffee and Hema, where I try to make a point about Hema and the time it takes to make a coffee. Um, I feel like I've done this rant before, but I can't find it, so either I filmed it and forgot to upload it, or I just have missed it, so apologies if you've heard me talk about this. Uh, today, I want to talk about tournament design. Um, how we set up our tournaments and sort of competing priorities uh, and why I think we consistently get it wrong as a community. Um, I am going to come across as a bit of a hypocrite in this because I'm going to be criticizing the style that uh, the Wessex League runs, which is the tournament I run. I'll just point out that I am one of the organizers for Wessex League and I do not have complete control over the, uh, the tournament design for that, especially because I inherited it. Um, but really, this boils down to me thinking that the pools and elimination structure that most tournaments run is is not the best for the kinds of tournaments that we're actually running. Um, but to take a step back from that, you know, the first thing we've got to think about is well, what's the goal of a tournament? Um, and uh, the goal of professional sports, which is where most of us kind of interact with sports or even semi-professional sports, is to make sure that you've got the top competitors getting to the finals um, to give you a nice spectacular final that everybody wants to watch. Uh, there's a lot of money in professional sports, uh, so that's both for the benefit of the broadcasters and for the, the competitors, the teams, the individuals, whatever it happens to be, um, you know, to have this kind of incentive of, of you know, essentially the best rise to the top. Um, uh, people are much more likely to come watch your final if it's between Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal versus two random tennis players that I don't know. Uh, yeah, even I, even I know those two, and I don't give a shit about tennis. Um, we don't really have that need in HEMA, right? HEMA tournaments are amateur. There's no money riding on them. At best, there's a, you know, a few prizes that probably the top prize winner is getting prizes that might be about half of what they've paid to be at the tournament. Um, you know, it's nice, don't get me wrong, but uh, no, one's, no one's making their living off HEMA tournaments. Um, you get a shiny piece of tin. We also have uh, much more of a mixing pot of skills in HEMA tournaments than professional thought sports, right? You know, um, even the, the, the lowest competitor to it in Wimbledon or whatever is a fantastic tennis player, don't get me wrong, right? You know, they're not, uh, they're not uh, Serena Williams, <laughs> again, picking a few tennis. I don't want to pick in tennis. I know nothing about tennis. Um, but, uh, but they're all you know, people who are pretty much making their living off tennis. Again, no one in HEMA is doing that. But also, you, know, you still have tournaments in HEMA where you have the world number one and a person who has never competed before in their life can enter the same tournament. Um, and fine, our world number one is not as much of an athlete as uh, <laughs> tennis world number one. Um, but, uh, but there's still a massive skill disparity between those two people. Uh, and you know many other people within within the tournament. So what what's my point? My point is that as an organizer, when I'm thinking about tournament format, actually this kind of guaranteeing that the the top fences rise shouldn't really be my primary motivation in to pick in determining what I do with full uh, well tournament format design. For me, obviously the most important thing is no one gets injured, right? I think pretty pretty universal and controversial on that. And then the second most important for me is that everybody in that tournament has a good time. And what is a good time? We can debate about that, right? But everybody in that tournament has a good time. So for me, it is as important for the top seed to have fun and get a good number of fights that they, you know, they're enjoying uh, as it is for the bottom seed. Um, and one of the biggest problems then in terms of achieving that goal uh, Sorry, before I get into that, yes, it is important that we don't have a complete random dice toss and the top fencer is just some random person that, you know, they got lucky. Um, but that is secondary to anything else. You know, this kind of everyone having fun is much more important to me. So the tournament structure of pools and eliminations, if you haven't done one, right, you know, you have, you seed all your fences. So you've got the top seed is the best fencer or the best uh, hero ratings or whatever. Bottom seed is someone new. Uh, you create pools that are roughly even split, um, but in the way that you make pools, for instance, the pool one will probably have your top one seed and your bottom seed, right? So the um, the pools for the top fences will be slightly easier than the pools for the fourth or the fifth fence or whatever happens to be for the for the top fencer. 
then you have some determining criteria that then leads to some of those fences going on to the elimination round, and then they have a single elimination normally where, you know, one fight and you're out. Um, so that format encourages the people in those pools to try and get as many points, whatever those points happen to be as possible, you know, whatever the, the criteria is for, for passing through. Um, and essentially leads to these top fences needing to farm points off the beginner fences. You know, they can't really go easy on them because it determines their, their standing. I mean, they can if they don't care too much about tournament performance, but that's not what you're trying to encourage with tournament rules. You're trying to encourage specific behavior. The behavior encouraged is get as many points as possible um, off the fences who are potentially significantly worse than you. And again, if you have this situation where you've got a brand new fencer uh, and the number one of the world, they will be in the same pool, right? Um, and uh, and likewise, then you know the, the the lower seeds in a pool are very unlikely to go through elimination, so they actually have direct detriment and they have fewer fights as a result. As well as that, they're not likely to have anyone who is closely matched to them. Right? They are going to be matched up against um, you know people who are all seeded. Again, seeding determines its own purpose. Um, so you get a situation where someone might be keep going to pools and their rating keeps getting lower, lower, lower. And so they keep getting into, put into harder and harder pools as a result of that, rather than getting some people who are kind of similar to them. So for me, the criteria for trying to make sure everyone has a good time, and I appreciate that not everybody agrees with this, um, but um, that's always going to happen. I, I feel like the rule of thumb for making sure everyone has a good time is, first of all, making sure that everybody has the same number of matches. And second of all, making sure that they have at least a good range of matches, but probably converging towards ones which are close to them in skill level, right? So, you know, it can be fun to have a match or two against somebody who's, who outclasses you, and, you know, it's a learning experience. Um, but to have all of your matches where you feel completely outclassed will just is very disheartening. It makes you feel like you're not very good, uh, when it's probably just that you've got six years less experience than the other people in your pool. Um, so that's nothing on you. That's just your less experience. You've been doing it less time. Um, I have played about with a bunch of formats to kind of achieve this. So, so the metric being, again, everybody has the same number of fights. Everybody gets at least some close matches and a good range of matches. And ideally, you want your fights to be converging to closer and closer matches, so closer in skill levels as the tournament goes on. Swiss system formats do this, right? So what happens with Swiss system is the first round is determined normally, you know, top seed, bottom seed. Every subsequent round, you're paired with the person who's performed similarly to you so far. And in theory, you kind of get these close matches coming up. There are different ways you can structure that uh, in terms of how you do the actual matchups. Um, and, and that's a pretty standard tournament format out there. I like doing series of pools. Uh, I've played about with a few formats where what happens is you get pools, and essentially at every stage, there's relatively small pools, so not pools of six, pools of three or four. At every stage, what happens is the uh, you split each group into two groups. The top half of your, by performance of your group, go up. The bottom half by performance go down uh, until you get to the point where you've got two people who are matching up for a final. Um, I've played about with uh, doing um, a pool round as normal and then going to a Swiss round, and everybody goes to Swiss round. That's fun too, right? And again, what you can have with that is essentially the 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 top bracket, the top round of the pools, people who, people who are winning their Swiss round is essentially an elimination bracket. But what happens is if you lost your elimination fight, you're not done. You're still fighting. Just fighting for a lower position, um, and in theory, again, at the end of that, you'll get somebody who's performed pretty much the same as you across the tournament. So you're getting a final fight uh, with everybody, uh, with somebody who is um, similarly performed. I did for the beginners tournament in Wessex. I did uh, two pool rounds, pools of three, followed by a final, um, and. The it's the same that uh, you know the first pool round determines your seeding, the second pool round because we don't know the seeding because everyone's new. We randomly do the first one, the second one is seeded based upon performance, and then the final round is based upon there's one other person who's closest to you. So first fight second, third fight fourth, fifth fight sixth, etc. All the way down the bottom. So everybody again gets the same number of fights. Everybody ends with a fight which should in theory be closely matched because it's somebody who's performed similarly. There are tons of other ways you can do this, right? There are tons of other ways you can do this. We default to limbs pools because pool the limbs because a that's what we normally see in professional sports. B, it is easier to run. I will say that um, all the more interesting styles I've done are less easy to run. 
yeah, they'll have some kind of logistical challenge or numeric challenge you've got to work through. Um, but uh, but fundamentally, I think it's worth experimenting with styles uh, to make sure that we have a nice spread of things. And again, the most important thing is that bottom seed in your tournament who's never done the tournament before, you want them to come back and do more tournaments and you know, get better. Um, and making sure that they have a good time that they don't come out of it thinking I'm a shit fencer. Why did I ever do this and never do tournaments again? Uh, it, it should be explicitly one of your goals, uh, whether it's via this method or some other method, right? Um, so don't just worry about your top fences getting a bunch of fights. Make sure that everybody is coming out of that having had a good time. Play about with formats. Some of the ideas I tried, maybe some other ones as well. Thanks for watching.